Winding rivers and rolling mountains encompass a region of the U.S. that has somehow subdued Western migration, condo homes, and chain stores. An area where ranching and fly fishing culture continue to prevail despite other Western towns becoming modernized like falling dominoes. The label trout mecca gets thrown around a lot in fishing circles, but no area receives this designation as often as southwestern Montana. When someone says they're going fishing out west, they're referring to an abstract notion of the Jefferson River Basin. It's hard to believe the long-term health of this fishery is now in question as trout populations are at historic lows on many of these rivers and streams. Fishing pressure, below average snowpack, warming water temps, low flows, drought, nutrient pollution, algae blooms, and even fungal outbreaks are all being observed, but how and why these variables are compounding to affect the heart of trout country remains unclear. As an angler who has been visiting and fishing this area for almost 20 years, I've been anxiously waiting for the trout population survey results to be released each spring. As the survey numbers fell for another consecutive year, I wanted to get a better understanding of exactly what is happening on the Jefferson River Basin by interviewing some, but certainly not all, of the key stakeholders. Following are excerpts from these interviews that hopefully convey the diverse viewpoints and contextual complexities associated with the ongoing health of trout paradise. We're sitting in the middle of the best wild trout fishing in the United States. What we're hearing is incredibly low numbers and we're not catching incredibly low numbers. We're doing quite, we're doing fine catching, if not better quality trout than we've seen in years. We've been collecting data on the on the Big Hole River since consistently since the late 70s. And so every year we do a fish population estimates on several sections of the river. And so, um, you know, historically, uh, the river uh, regulations changed in the early 80s, you know, back when harvest was a big deal on the river and the fish populations responded to that. They climbed and kind of plateaued and they've been kind of in that realm for 20 years there's little ebbs and flows as conditions get wetter and drier but over the last five years we've seen a really precipitous decline in particularly brown trout numbers and more recently this last year and rainbows too in 2014 at a peak of uh, uh nearly 2,000 brown trout a mile and now we're about 300 browns a mile we have studied, you know, these sorts of declines and things in the past. And um, what we're what we know is, like I said before, is that water is a big driver of these systems. So in good water years, um, we have really good survival of little fish. And then that really good survival then translates into several years, of course, of, of good fishing afterwards. Water is a big driver for the fishery, but our decline started when we saw average water years and we've had dry times before the early 2000s were really dry um, for like six years in a row and our trout populations declined then but we've declined you know more than double what we would expect during a drought sort of time so there's something going on above and beyond just water uh, in the big hole as far as what's going on with our fish numbers right now. While it's easy to kind of get it caught up in this, this doom and gloom of a fishery decline that is so iconic, um, it's super important to step back and acknowledge what's at stake um, when you have this sort of an environmental um, problem. And in Beaverhead County alone, we're talking $167 million annual recreation economy. Um, we're talking about 1,400 jobs directly tied to it. Uh, we're talking about a lot of small fly shops, 
outfitting businesses, uh, restaurants, bars, hotels, cabins, lodging. Um, we're talking about a whole lot of people supporting families um, and careers and livelihoods based on the health of this river. Are we gonna be shut down in October for the rest of, for perpetuity? Can I no longer sell big old river float trips in the fall of the year, which is one of our most popular times? <laughs> until we, we get hard facts, and this is what we're doing as a department, FWP, then I can work with and, and change my business model accordingly. But when you get told in the spring of the year that you're not gonna be able to fish this fall, that, 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 it, the, the trickle down effect from that is massive, massive. Not just me, it's everyone. It's the, it's the shuttle drivers, the store, my housekeepers. Maybe there's a degree to which folks can do a better job messaging because while this is critical, ecologically, there is an economic cost and um, individual and family cost involved as well. Um, to me, that makes it all the more important for us to focus agency and individual and organizational resources, get them together and direct them towards this specific problem, identify what's happening, because unless we can define it, there's no way that you can chart a course forward to address it. Kind of similar to how we want the in particular, the multi-generational family ranches to survive in this area because they are an equally critical part of the community fabric um, and the landscape fabric um, with regard to protecting open space, with regard to um, a buffer zone against the excess development that we've seen elsewhere, like in Gallatin County and Missoula and, and the Flathead Valley. You know, we got it pretty good right now. And if those families can't survive, those businesses can't survive, you're talking about subdevelopment. You're talking about uh, likely more water use when you start implementing 35 gallon a minute wells uh, for a subdivision. Another rancher down the river, Jim Hagenbar, always says this. You know, he says, you know, we're, we're blessed to have these private property rights, but one of the you know, the unspoken social contract of, of folks in agriculture owning this property is that we're stewarding it and that we're preserving it and preserving, you know, the ecosystems and the environments that we exist in, uh, not only for the next generation to be able to be productive in agriculture and raise food, but also for, you know, our neighbors and, and folks from, from around our state and our country and even around the world to come and enjoy, you know, these beautiful resources. This perception that we don't care uh, I think sometimes I, I feel uh, when I know that's not true. Uh, the land wouldn't look the way it is. It wouldn't be here in the pristine condition that draws all the people to this area if we hadn't been taking care of it. If there's an agricultural practice that is leading to some of these issues or some of these impacts, in, in some respects, I think that's, then let's find it because I think the good story there is uh, a negative contribution of agriculture, then I think that's a problem we can readily solve. You need to know temperature and flow. Uh, we need gauges. We need to free up the biologists to do the studies and lead the studies. And uh, we need technicians. We need fish technicians to look for diseased fish. We need fish technicians to do spawning surveys, to do red surveys. And uh, we need to work cooperatively, right? No name calling or finger pointing. Let's, let's roll up our sleeves and get the job done. I think an ounce of prevention at this stage is worth a pound of cure. And if all users of these natural resources give a little bit, then we can all have what we've enjoyed, you know, for the last 150 years of ranching and last 100 years of, of fishing. And this state 
has a rich outdoor heritage and depends on these natural resources. So we all have to come together right now and, and make a plan for the future rather than continually react to situations like this in the Jefferson Basin. We started Save Wild Trout because Fish, Wildlife and Parks is one leg of the stool of river management in Montana. And the other two legs are DNRC that work on flow and Department of Environmental Quality that works on the pollutions data and the water quality, the water chemistry of the rivers. We had the governor out to Wise River, Montana and, and he tasked Fish, Wildlife and Parks with dealing with this crash and the data is available to them from those other agencies. And we saw a benefit in privately funded science joining the conversation and, and offering um, you know, collaborative data where we needed a science team lead to do that. So we fundraised through Patagonia and Yeti and Orvis and Sims and several other industry partners, uh, enough of a budget to hire Dr. Kyle Flynn and uh, rent some very expensive water quality monitoring devices that we put in the rivers this summer. And as we move off the river into the office this winter, we're building out that plan uh, with Kyle at the helm. This is a wake up call for Western wild trout fisheries and mobilizing now and putting people like Dr. Flynn and the Fish, Wildlife and Parks team and the Department of Environmental Quality staff and the DNRC folks and bringing them to a table to discuss options and opportunities and make sure that the state in their, their fisheries management plans moving forward incorporate all the tools in their tool belt ensures we have a vibrant and robust future for these rivers. There's no better time to come to Montana than right now. Come involve yourself with this effort and these fisheries and, and visit them and know how special they are and how important it is to protect them.